É uma honra, um prazer introduzir aqui, apresentar o professor Nilma Cormack, uma apresentação que eu faço em nome da, da coordenação do evento que me pediu que o fizesse. Eu vou apresentar muito rapidamente o professor Nilma Cormack, porque todos que estão aqui presentes têm uma certa, uma clara noção da importância dele para a filosofia do direito no mundo todo e quase todos conhecem o seu, o seu currículo, então seria redundante ficar explicando longamente o currículo do professor McCormick. O professor McCormick é uh, professor da, uh, da, da Universidade de Edimburgo, é professor da Universidade de Edimburgo, é mérito, e foi professor, uh, Regis Professor uh, aqui na Universidade de Edimburgo por 36 anos. Hoje ele é um professor emérito da casa, uh, colaborando com os nossos cursos ainda. Uh, e o professor Neil McCormick ficou mundialmente conhecido a partir de uma série de livros publicados entre a década de 70 e mais recentemente até o ano passado, 2007, entre os vários livros que se destacam, o primeiro, Legal Reason and Legal System, traduzido para o português uh, e o uh, Rhetoric and the Rule of Law, recentemente traduzido para o português e agora sendo lançado durante o evento aqui, uh, se destacam, mas não são os únicos que se destacam. Uh, uh, a teoria, uh, an Institutional Theory of Law, um, mais recentemente Institutions of Law, são todos livros que tem, uh, tiveram e têm uma importância uh, marcante dentro da filosofia do direito uh, contemporâneo. E não há ninguém, talvez, que tenha tido uh, mais influência uh, ao longo dos últimos, das últimas décadas uh, no mundo anglo-saxão em termos de interpretação do que o professor Neil McCormack. Uh, ele editou um famoso livro, um famoso trabalho comparado sobre a interpretação de, de uh, leis, né, interpreting statutes, depois interpreting precedents, uh, sobre precedentes judiciais. Ele é, sem dúvida, uma das mais importantes autoridades do mundo sobre a interpretação. Mais uma das mais uma uh, que é uma razão uh, uh, que nos honra muito ter o professor McCormick aqui uh, de, falando para nós uh, nesse colóquio. Então, eu gostaria de, sem mais delongas, passar a palavra para o professor McCormick uh, para que ele possa nos apresentar o seu paper, originalmente escrito para essa conferência. Um, e depois nós vamos ter uh, perguntas feitas pelo uh, professor Conrado, por mim, e pelo professor Ronaldo, uh, ou por nós dois, em nome do professor Ronaldo, que nos mandou perguntas sobre o paper que ele já havia lido. Então, sem mais delongas, eu passo a palavra ao professor McCormack, uh, e assim ele pode nos, nos, nos brindar com o seu uh, mais novo produto, seu mais novo artigo. So, Professor McCormick, thank you very much for having agreed to, to take part in, in this exercise in this conference. And, um, well, I've introduced you already, so if you want to... Obrigado. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the kind words of introduction, some of which I understood. Um, I'd also like to thank Conrado Hutner-Mendes, who is beside me on, on the other side, for the work he and colleagues have done translating my book, Rhetoric and the Rule of Law, into Portuguese. I'm really very, very sorry to miss the conference and the launch of that book, owing to some minor medical problems. You may think, looking at me, and I think looking at myself, that I'm a bit of a fraud uh, as a supposedly sick person, unable to travel, but I have been advised that I shouldn't really do so, and I'm very, very disappointed to miss my first opportunity of visiting Brazil. I hope I'll uh, be luckier the next time. The paper I'm about to present has the title Law, Interpretation and Reasonableness. It's divided into four parts, the first of which with lapidary simplicity is called law, and I shall not begin it now. The law of any modern state is highly complex. Under the impact of globalization and with the growth of supranational confederations like the European Union, it grows more complex, not less so. These are commonplace beliefs. They're truisms, which are also true. One task of philosophical theory is to render intelligible that which is complex, and one way to achieve that is to take an analytical approach. Complex wholes may have simpler parts, and exhibiting how these are parts that make sense in the context of the whole that is made up of such parts helps us to simplify complexity for the purpose of understanding the object. In 2007, I published Institutions of Law, which is my final attempt at a holistic yet analytical explanation of the character of law. There was perhaps a time when analytical theory was taken to be simply a branch of legal positivism. 
But of course, an analytical approach is not necessarily a positivistic one. If the whole that you analyze turns out to have value-laden parts, irreducibly value-laden parts, then the whole has to be presented as engaged with these values. This is my conclusion about law, so I am not an analytical positivist, but at most an analytical post-positivist. In short terms, my analysis of law starts from an explanatory definition. Law is institutional normative order. To understand this, you must first understand how humans use norms in their mutual interaction, judging each other's conduct as right, wrong, correct or incorrect in a given context. Thus, having grasped the concept of norms of normativity, one can proceed to reflect upon orderliness and the special kind of order that can obtain among people who all observe a common norm, or more probably, uh, a considerable set of common norms. Next, one can reflect on the way in which two-tier or multiple-tier normative practices can grow up. This happens whenever, according to one norm, some people have to act as directed by another person. In that case, the directives of the other become themselves norms for the addressees. Here, one can introduce in a very simple way the concept of institutionalization and see how there can be a distinction between purely conventional or customary normative order and institutionalized order. Thus, one arrives at the concept of institutional normative order, as I elucidated. There are very many instances of this in the contemporary world, from international organizations and the law they observe and apply, through supranational confederations and states and sub-state polities within federal or quasi-federal states, but also churches and other religious organizations and societies, sporting organizations and the law of the sport they administer and regulate, transnational business entities and practices, many other human contexts reveal examples of institutional normative order. The explanatory explanation is well adapted to the kind of legal pluralism to which any sensitive observer of the contemporary human situation has to be intellectually open. In fact, the law of the modern state, so far from being the only or even the paradigmatic case of law, is simply one instance of it. For many practitioners of law and law professors, it is the main body of law that concerns them and is always at the forefront of their attention. Since states are coercive associations that can guarantee their law by recourse to coercive means, they can, at least in ambition, preclude the resort to physical co coercion in the enforcement of any other body of norms than those of or those recognized by the state itself. Accordingly, citizens have a particular reason to pay careful attention to the demands the state's law imposes on them. They may or may not also have a particular patriotic devotion uh, to the law as particularly their law. It's therefore important for a book like Institutions of Law to take special account of the character and typical structure of contemporary state law, of the contemporary law state, I should say, or constitutionalist state, in which the rule of law genuinely prevails, at least to a substantial extent. One has also to inquire into the conceptual framework of persons, things and actions, rights, real and personal, obligations, duties and wrongdoing, legal powers and their exercise, and the validity of institutional arrangements persons can establish through the exercise of such power. Then one should stand back and look at the architecture and functioning of the grand branches of state law. These are public law, criminal law and private law, and alongside them post-1945 human rights law as a kind of universal normative limit to the use of state power, ideally obstructing its abuse. Without public law, there is no functioning state. 
and no prospect of distributive justice. Without criminal law, reasonably well observed and fairly enforced, we look in vain for the civility of civil society. Without a settled and functioning corpus of private law, there can be no stable economy. Much law achieves little in the way of justice anywhere. Everywhere, some law, and perhaps a good deal of what passes as enforcement of it, are actually an instrument of injustice. Yet without an internal aspiration to justice, nothing is intelligible as law-oriented activity. Law has an implicit orientation to justice, according to some reasonably statable conception of that virtue. For that reason, the positivist tenet of the conceptual separation of law from morals is untenable, and its untenable character is revealed by a thoroughgoing and dispassionate analysis of law as institutional normative order. In that sense, post-positivism is the only reasonable posture for the analytical jurist today. Whether or not this requires recourse to the tools and reasoning of traditional natural law theories is another question. It remains, however, the case that in a even in a democratic society, the citizen experiences a kind of at least partial heteronomy in the face of the law's demands. The law one obeys as citizen is often not the law that one would will as an ideal lawgiver. The petty injustices and cruelties of much law cut against the grain of a good human being's conscience. Yet also in conscience, one may sometimes consider that conformity to law for the sake of peace and order is the preferable of evils. Conscience apart, one may be aware of the pressure of threatened or probable legal sanctions in the event of non-conformity, and one may on that account comply with some rule of law though acknowledging no moral commitment on its behalf. For anyone who is tempted to hold a Kantian or post-Kantian idea of autonomy or self-command as a foundational element in any true moral order, it follows that there is indeed a conceptual distinction between the state's law and the moral law. This is so, even though the state must have some commitment to justice if its norms are to count as law at all. Quite simply, in moral order we are autonomous. Under legal order we are partly at least heteronomous. This difference is fundamental. I say this because I am not really tempted by but convinced in favour of autonomy as foundational to morality. But there remains much to be explored about this concept in its application to the dichotomy of law and morality, and that's the topic on which I'm myself working just now. These remarks, then, as well as summarising key elements of my philosophy of law, are essential preliminaries to the object of this paper, namely some further reflection on reasonableness in legal interpretation and on legal interpretations of the virtue of reasonableness. Here I am returning to themes explored in my early legal reasoning and legal theory and my later rhetoric and the rule of law. Now I come to the second part of the paper which has the subheading Application, Interpretation and Argumentation. One salient feature of the institutional arrangements of a state under the rule of law is the existence of a judicial power separate from the executive and the legislature of the state, staffed by properly qualified judges who are themselves independent of the other branches of government. Another truism. They are also personally and institutionally impartial in their adjudication of the matters lawfully brought before them for decision. Yet, each has to act as a member of a judiciary that has a certain collective cohesiveness and community of approach. The existence of hierarchies of appeal in which relatively decentralized local adjudication at first instance is ultimately susceptible of appeal or review for cassation at highest level single tribunals 
helps to secure and inculcate this imperative of relative cohesiveness. This is of great importance when everyone considers the law in its manifold areas of concrete application, especially those applications that are achieved through judicial decisions. The institutional norms of law are enshrined in codes promulgated by the legislature or in more piecemeal and opportunistic acts of legislation and in some systems they also include uh, I beg your pardon in some systems uh, they also include norms derived from the precedents of superior courts and tribunals fidelity to the constitutional order of their state and to the rule of law within it requires the judges to see to it that these norms of law are properly applied often it may be the case or may be accepted without contest by all interested parties that the facts of a given situation are reasonably clear and that they match in an uncomplicated way the facts treated as operative in some relevant legal rule or rules where this is so the construction of a case by private litigants or by public prosecutors will exhibit a very straightforward syllogistic pattern and the same pattern will, however informally in expression, suffuse the judge's justification for a decision reached in the case so constructed. But not all cases are straightforward. The rules laid down in statutes regulate generic cases. Whenever certain events occur in certain circumstances, a certain legal conclusion is to follow. Whenever a person driving a car has in his or her bloodstream a quantity of alcohol that exceeds 80 milligrams per 100 milliliters of her or his blood, that person is guilty of an offense and is liable if convicted to be ordered to pay a fine and to be disqualified from driving for a period not less than one year. This has of course to be backed up by other rules concerning the administration by police of tests for blood alcohol and concerning the proper method of providing evidence of this, and so on. All these other rules are also generic, or indeed in a technical sense, universal in character. They apply to whoever satisfies the conditions stipulated in the rules, being a person, being a person driving a motor vehicle, and so on. For a prosecutor to construct a case against a suspected drunk driver, and then to draft a suitable complaint or indictment, bringing the case before a competent court, it is obviously essential to check that all the conditions laid down in the rule are or appear to be fulfilled, and that the evidence for this was obtained in a regular manner as, applied, as provided in the statute. This must all be recited in the indictment, and put to proof at trial court by recourse to competent witnesses or other forms of admissible evidence, except to the extent that the accused admits certain facts or indeed pleads guilty as charged. A judge who, or a jury which, holds that all points have been adequately proved is then in a position to give an uncomplicated verdict of guilty on the basis that the allegations in the indictment have all been proved, and that taken together they satisfy the conditions stipulated in statute as to what counts as the offence of driving with excess alcohol in one's bloodstream. The verdict is justified simply because the facts validly proven fulfil the conditions in terms of which the law defines this offence. I have elsewhere explained in detail what needs not be explained in detail here how this process of constructing a case, proving it, and finally judging upon it, has an obviously syllogistic character. The legal syllogism lies at the heart of all legal proceedings conducted under the rule of law. The syllogism, however, indicates not only what must be proved to secure a conviction, it also shows what must be attacked in order to avoid one. A footballer has spent New Year's Eve drinking with friends, one of whom has an apartment in which he has been invited to spend the night. 
after quite a few drinks, the host and others set off with young women whose acquaintance they have made in the course of the evening. The footballer has not been so fortunate and is left on his own. Exhausted and disappointed, he decides to go to bed. But he has no key and cannot gain entry to the apartment. It's a bitterly cold night. He opens his car, parked near the apartment, and settles down to sleep for the night. In the morning, the police discover him in the driver's seat of the car, having woke up, woken up from an uncomfortable night's sleep. He is charged with driving while having an excess of alcohol in his bloodstream. His defence is that he was not driving at all, and had no intention to drive till much later on New Year's Day. What then counts as driving? And what counts as a vehicle? Riding horses on the public highway when drunk can be very dangerous, just as much as driving a car. Could a horse count as a vehicle? I know of at least one case in which a prosecutor has constructed a case on that footing, though in this case, as in the footballers, the verdict was one of acquittal. Since the introduction of the breathalyzer in many countries, and for other purposes of road traffic legislation, there has grown up a considerable body of decisions on the issue of what counts as driving, what counts as a vehicle, and so on. Then there is the issue of carelessness in driving. Motor vehicles are potentially highly dangerous to other road users. Drivers must take proper care. But then how much care is it reasonable to take, reasonable to demand of a person driving a vehicle or doing some other potentially hazardous thing. For various purposes, legal systems use evaluative terms like reasonable, fair, careless, reckless and such like. This is aimed at trying to deal with the problem of striking a balance between conditions for what is a delict or tort subject to a civil remedy or a punishable offence on the one hand and what has to be treated as acceptable in the way of demands made, by made upon people as drivers or in other such positions. This is not simply a matter of balancing the interests of drivers or whatever against the interests of pedestrians or other road users as though they were completely different categories. The very same people may sometimes be drivers exposed to unacceptably stringent requirements and sometimes pedestrians exposed to the risk of excessively lax standards of driving. The balance sought is a balance between interests everyone has, though in the concrete case, any one person will be exposed to risk only in the one or the other role. These simple examples show how certain typical problems arise in legal argumentation. The ones in issue here are problems of classification and problems of evaluation. What are we to classify or characterize as driving in the context of and for the purpose of applying a law against drunk driving? What care is it proper to demand of a reasonable person in the role of driver or of manufacturer or occupier of premises? There's no very clear line between these, of course, since the evaluative question can be rephrased as what are we to classify or characterize as reasonable in this context and for this purpose. Nevertheless, there's always a very clear element of value judgment where evaluative pre predicates are, issue, are an issue. And this is not so obvious where more straightforwardly descriptive terms like drive and vehicle are in play. Both these questions can also be phrased as, or anyway, shade over into, into questions of interpretation of whole legal texts. Here we ask not whether this or that conduct counts as driving, but how it is proper to interpret the legal provision as a whole to make satisfactory sense of it in its application to a given situation. This more holistic view may prove helpful in dealing with the more detailed question of classification or of evaluation that faces us in a particular case. At least in common law systems, and I think also almost universally in the context of constitutional adjudication, a yet more far-reaching issue can arise. 
concerning what counts as legally relevant at all. A claim may be made by one citizen against another, or an issue may arise between citizen and state in a matter that touches on constitutional fundamentals. But is there any legal issue here at all? It may be asked. Suppose everything of which the complainer complains did happen, or is in the process of being carried through. Even if so, the court may ask, is there any relevant provision of law at all, any kind of legal norm or principle that deals with this matter? Is there any legal ground for the kind of intervention or the kind of remedy the complainer seeks? Problems of this kind I call problems of relevancy. Apart from sheer problems of fact, what can be proved to have happened? These problems of classification, of evaluation, of interpretation and of relevancy exhaust the possibility of problematizing issues in adjudication where this is conducted in the setting of institutional normative order in circumstances where the rule of law prevails. What other problems could there possibly be? From the point of view of those who crave for legal certainty, it is indeed regrettable that such problems can arise at all. But in any state that recognizes the rights of the defense to challenge allegations by public authorities or private citizens, to contest issues of these kind must always be legitimate. To withdraw the rights of the defense to mount challenges on such counts is itself to subvert the rule of law. Hence, law in action is always a locus of argumentation and interpretation. However clear the legal materials may appear to be on a static view in the dynamics of law application and legal contestation of accusations and of claims, there are always ongoing arguments. These concern how it is best to read or interpret the law in order to achieve justice when the law comes to be applied. That is the end of the second part of the paper, and I now turn to the third, which bears the subheading Universalization and the Three C's. That the context of, is that of law and adjudication already determines certain structural features. First, laws are, as noted, universalistic in their expression. They are written with a view to apply wherever their operative facts stated in them occur. And whenever they do, a universally prescribed legal consequence is in every such case to be derived. This is so even though each case is a particular one involving particular persons in a particular setting. Laws are universal, but cases are unique. Moreover, the remedy or punishment ordered at the conclusion of a case is in itself once off. It is an individualized order affecting just this defendant and no one else. Notwithstanding the uniqueness of the instance, however, the law applies by virtue of the instantiation of the universals in which it is framed. The same universality is necessarily involved in any answer a judge or court frames to the problem question we have framed. Once one decides what counts as driving, or as a vehicle in this case, on the ground of the features identified in the argument, one is committed to treating these very features as relevant in the same way in any future context of decision. The individual decision has to be universalistic, has to be universalizable, and indeed will typically be expressed universally. This is a built-in feature of the logic of justification. In the nature of the case, however, this implies that there are choices. If there is an argument about relevancy, classification, or interpretation, it's because one side offers a particular universalizable reading of what the law means, and the other side either denies this or offers an alternative reading. So, how can one justify a preference between rival possibilities? The answer I offer 
is in terms that have been called the three C's consequences, coherence and consistency